You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us today. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis, and my co-host is my trusty service dog, Whistle. And Whistle and I are so excited to have as our special guest today, Ellen Turup from Canine Companions for Independence. And Ellen is the Northeast Regional Program Manager at CCI. And as many of you know, CCI is the largest assistance dog organization in the United States. So come right back after these quick messages from our sponsors as we welcome Ellen to the show. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Petco, where the pets go. Petco, where the pets go. Pet Life Radio has tail wagging, fur flying, fabulous deals for our listeners from Petco. Get six dollars off your order of sixty dollars or more, and up to forty percent off the entire Petco site. That's right, but that's not all. Because you're a Pet Life Radio listener, you'll also get free shipping on your order of forty nine dollars or more. Six dollars off. Up to 40% off and free shipping from Pet Life Radio and Petco. To get these awesome deals, go to PetcoDeals.com. That's PetcoDeals.com. Petco, where the pets go. I don't make any decisions about who to hire without going to Angie's List first. You'll find reviews on home repair to health care written by people just like you. With Angie's List, I know who to call and I know the results will be fantastic. Angie's List you can trust. Go to Angie'sList.com forward slash best and get 25% off any subscription. That's Angie'sList.com forward slash best, B-E-S-T. Having a rough day? Longing for the dog days of summer? Think your fun furry friend lives a dog's life? Well, find out everything you're begging to know as Pet Life Radio presents It's a Doggy Dog World with pet expert and award-winning author Liz Palaika. Every dog has his day, and you'll find out how to make your dog's day fun and rewarding every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Whistle and I would like to welcome our special guest today, Ellen Turup. Hello, Ellen, and welcome. Hi, Marcy. Thank you. Well, we're so excited you could be with us today. I'm very excited to be able to speak with you about my passion and and yours as well. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, I have to tell our listeners that I have known Ellen for almost 20 years now, and Ellen was actually my trainer when I got my first service dog, Ramona. So, Ellen, you've always had a special place in my heart. Thank you, Marcy. I've, I remember those those days in class so well and your enthusiasm and all of the effort that you put into working with your first dog really has always stood out in my mind as well. Oh, thanks, Ellen. Well, tell us, tell our listeners about your job at CCI. Well, my job encompasses overseeing pretty much everything that happens with the dogs and the people who receive them. I oversee the puppy program. So we have a puppy raising program where people will volunteer to take puppies into their homes, raise them for us and prepare them to start their advanced training. And the applicant program, obviously we have people applying to receive these dogs once trained. Our team training program, where people are coming in to go through a two-week course to be matched up with the dog and learn how to utilize it and care for it. And our follow-up program, which is the contact that we give to our graduate teams after they've been placed for the 10 or so years that the dog is working for them. Yeah, wow. So you really do the whole entire process from puppy to to follow-up and successor dogs. That's awesome. 
I do now for, you know, for many, many years, my, the primary focus of my job was training. And uh, I, don't, I don't get to train. I get to problem solve now, but I'm not, I'm not training on a regular basis, but I'm working with the trainers so that they can ready dogs for more and more people. Yeah. Well, tell us, Ellen, how did you get started working as a trainer? Because I know so many people ask that. How do they get started? Yeah. And I think as many people as you ask, that's how many different answers you'll probably get. I started out, I studied animal behavior when I was in college. And my thought was that I was going to do behavioral research. And what I found after about a year and a half or so of graduate school was that I didn't, I didn't so much like being in a laboratory. I felt disconnected. And I had heard and read about, I think hearing dogs actually were the first type of assistance dogs that I was aware of. And I was fascinated by what they could do. And it had always been, animals had always been a huge part of my life growing up, but not in a working capacity. But I had heard about hearing dogs and I became sort of obsessed with them. And I started to support a number of organizations that were training them. And as I became more and more unhappy with being locked up in a laboratory away from the world, I started to realize I needed to change my goal. And so from graduate school, I left and I I spent some time in New York City working with a woman who did pet training. And I started to get my hands on dogs. In, In graduate school, I had spent hours and hours and hours watching livestock guarding dogs, literally just watching them and sort of marking off their behaviors. No interaction, no contact, certainly no training. So when I started in New York in the city with pet training, I knew dogs from books but I didn't know dogs hands-on. So it was a very different experience to get in there and, and also to work with their owners because that's a whole different ball game as well. So that's where I started with pet training in New York City for a while, but I still always was drawn back to the idea that dogs were so much more than, than just that emotional connection, which actually I think is probably the most powerful thing they offer us. And the thought of hearing dogs and dogs assisting people in some capacity just kept coming back to me. And uh, ultimately, Canine Companions for Independence was ready to open up a center in New York. And I just jumped at the opportunity. That was back in 1989. And I've been here ever since. Wow. Wow. Well, that's quite the journey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about CCI's dogs. You know, how are they, how do you select a dog for the program to know that that dog will be a good working dog for a person with a disability? It's a really long process. It starts with our own breeding program. We've really created a dog. Most of the dogs that we use are labs. Goldens are a cross between the two. And that dog really is almost like a breed unto itself. They mature more quickly. They're very, very calm. They're very biddable. They're cooperative. So we we start with the right material to begin with. And we guide our puppy raisers very carefully about how to raise them so that they can be prepared to face anything in the world with confidence, without fear, without aggression, to be easily handled, and to have a good attitude about learning, to want to learn, to, to think learning is fun. Once they're raised and, and they're ready to start their training, they come into our center and they have to go through a whole slew of evaluations. There are hip x-rays and elbow x-rays and eye exams and heart exams and temperament tests and public evaluations. And they're, they're looked at head to toe, <laughs> nose to tail, I should say. <laughs> and um, the, so the process is pretty long in selecting which ones we think are going to work potentially well for the people that are waiting on our waiting list for dogs. And at that point, they'll have to go through at least six months of advanced training. And I'll tell you that out of those dogs that are selected from the original batch, that are healthy and and confident and stable and showing the characteristics that we want, there are still a number that don't make it. They don't make it through the program for sometimes very trivial reasons. They want to chase squirrels. They, They bark at noises. Things that, you know, they're wonderful pets, they're wonderful dogs, there's nothing wrong with them, but things that might make it either inappropriate for them to be working in public or a management issue for someone with a disability. So it's a very long, very careful process of scrutinizing the dog, testing them in a lot of situations, and ultimately deciding, does this dog have what it takes? 
Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. I remember when I was going through the program and the first dog that I took to the hotel with me after training was had some issues with the elevator. And I remember telling you about his reaction to the elevator and how then you took that dog away from me and gave me another dog. So yeah, <laughs> that whole process you're talking about, but but I understand that now because I I'm in a lot of elevators. So for me as a person with a disability, that dog probably wasn't the best. And I'm sure that's hard for a lot of people to hear that, especially puppy raisers. But I certainly can appreciate the scrutinizing that, that you and your staff do to make sure that these dogs are, are great matches and have the skills that their person with a disability really needs. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's so great about this field is it's still a relatively new field. And so we as trainers or organizations or individuals that are looking for these dogs and training and placing them are still learning. We're learning from our clients. We're learning from the people that are working with these dogs about what we need. It's an ever-changing field. And so uh, I think back when you came in to get Ramona, it was back in the early 90s, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, And we were working out of a very, very small facility out on Long Island and had a lot of limitations on what we could do. And so many things have changed over the years in terms of what we've learned. For example, elevators, all of our dogs are tested on elevators and practiced on elevators and worked on them before they even go into a class. So we learn from our history and we're constantly trying to improve things and sit down and talk to people and say, what do you need? What would make this better? And that's what makes this job so much fun and challenging. It's not always the same. But yeah, it's so wonderful. I know. I know. Just the work that you're doing is just so incredible and the lives that you're changing. I mean, I'm living proof of the lives you've changed because getting Ramona 20 years ago, it really, really changed my life. And that's what you're doing every day, which is just so incredible. It's really exciting to be a part of it. And it's exactly what I was looking for years ago when I was in graduate school and feeling disconnected because I can see... On a day-to-day basis, I can see people being affected by what's happening. We're in the middle of running a class right now. Our graduation is actually tomorrow. We'll have 11 new teams graduating. And uh, last night, I sat down with the students, and we all had dinner together. And the conversations that some of the children were having were different than they were almost two weeks ago. The way that they were relating to each other and one another, their confidence level, things felt very, very different than they did a week and a half ago. And that's, that's just a week and a half. And, and I don't have to tell you that when you first get an assistance dog, especially if it's your first one, it takes quite a while to sort of adapt to how to utilize that dog and how to make it work smoothly and sort of like learning how to drive a car. You know, at first you got to think about it all. And then one day you just find yourself moving along, (laughs) dogs picking things up for you, you're moving through spaces and it's like you've always done it. That's right. I know the first year that I had Ramona, I kept questioning, am I doing the right thing? Are we a good match? Am I, you know, is this what I I really wanted? Uh, Was I have a dog with me 24 hours a day? And then I remember toward the end of that first year, how I felt like she was a part of me. It was no longer Mm -hmm. just me, Marcy, and Ramona. We were one. You know, I mean, in that, and it's just so incredible what that does for a person with a disability, the confidence that you're talking about. I'm sure that these graduates are, are now displaying. It's just so amazing. And it's hard to really articulate that and how much a dog can really impact a person with a disability. But it is just monumental what it can do to really change your life. Yeah, it's enormous. But I think, you know, you bring up a really good point, which I think is worthy of discussion, which is that it's a huge commitment and it's a lot of work. Initially, (laughs) it's a tremendous amount of work. You have to change your life in order to accommodate to the dog's needs. You have something you have to take care of. You may have to change your schedule and work around it. And and it, it is a different life. It is not necessarily for everyone just because a person has a disability does not necessarily mean that a working dog is going to be right for them. You have to really, really be committed to, like you said, allowing yourself to sort of merge with this animal as a team and and moving together through life. It's a big change. It is a big change. I know. I mean, you have to get used to dog hair in your life. You know, it's like. (laughs) And a lot more than that, certainly. Yes, yes. There are a lot. People stopping you on the street wherever you go. 
Yep. Hard to yep. get from point A to point B. Yeah, there's no more running into the grocery store to get milk and running out. You have to really be aware that you you are an educational I, I feel like I'm a rolling educational spotlight really for assistance dogs. I feel like Absolutely, yep. yeah. Yeah. All of our graduates are. Yeah. All of our graduates are, uh, everyone out there that, you know, is using a working dog that's representing the industry that has the opportunity to educate the world that, uh, you know, this is, this is something that's out there that's really valuable. A lot of people, a lot of people still think the only kind of working dog there is is a guide dog. Right, right. And, uh, there are so many ways that dogs are being utilized to help people now. So graduates certainly and, and puppy raisers as well. The yeah. people that have yeah. volunteered their time to raise dogs for this purpose are a huge, huge use for us in terms of educating the world because they're out there with their puppies, they're socializing them, the puppies are wearing their capes, people ask questions, and they're able to tell them, hey, there's, there's something else here, and you can get involved. <laughs> well, tell us, how does someone become a puppy raiser? Well, there's an application process. Just like there's an application to receive a working dog, there's an application to raise one. You have to meet certain criteria You have to have the time to raise a puppy. It's time-consuming. You have to be willing to make the commitment to caring for them, you know, medically, for doing training with them, for socializing them. There's a whole whole list of, of requirements that you need to meet. At our organization, all you have to do is simply contact the region closest to where you live, and there's five training centers across the country. And say, I'm I'm interested in puppy raising, and our puppy program manager will give you the basic information about what's involved, talk to you about your lifestyle, your home environment, are are there other pets in your home, what's their status, what's your experience. You don't have to be an experienced dog trainer to raise a puppy. Far from it. We have Girl Scouts and and Boy Scouts and 4-Hers and families and older couples, it really runs the gamut. Everyone can get involved in doing it if they have the time and the patience, because certainly a puppy takes patience, and the inclination to want to reach out and help somebody else, to, to give something away. If you feel like you're in a position where you can offer something to somebody else, it's a, it's a beautiful way to do it. It's a very selfless thing to do. It is, and I just can't say enough about the three puppy raisers that I've had the pleasure of meeting and, and even more pleasure of having the amazing dogs that they trained. And puppy raisers are just, they're just like angels on earth. I mean, they really are how they train these little adorable balls of fur and live with them during the first year or so of their life and then hand them over to you, Ellen, so that they can then grow and, and become the amazing working dogs that they do become. So what do you think makes a good puppy raiser? Consistency. <laughs> Probably the same things that make a good dog trainer or a dog handler. Consistency, certainly. Because dogs are very black and white. You know, Either they can or they can't. So if it's more than one person raising a puppy, you need to have everyone in the household in agreement that here are the rules. The dog is not allowed on the couch. The dog is allowed to do this. The dog can't jump up on people and how they're dealing with it as well. That consistency is very, very important. And I think a certain degree of empathy has to be there as well because you need to get outside of yourself and look at how another animal, another being is experiencing the world. Puppies aren't born knowing what sit and down and shake and, and how to walk on a leash. They don't know what those things mean. They have to be taught. So you have to have the patience, do lots of repetition and support them in that process and encourage them. Certainly what makes a good puppy raiser is somebody that has the time in their life to be able to to give that pup its training. And, you know, it's not 24-7. There's times out. Puppies typically will be very, very active and then all of a sudden asleep, <laughs> very, very <laughs> asleep. And then they'll be up and they'll be very, very active again. So, you know, to have the flexibility in your schedule where you can work around those puppies' needs, some people have been able to work with the agencies they work for and bring their puppies to work. So, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I think in answer to your question, what makes a good puppy raiser is primarily, I would say, the dedication, consistency, and, and some degree of, of selflessness to, to be able to see the world through another creature's eyes and to hand over something so precious to someone yeah. else. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm so thankful that they can do that. I don't know if I could, but I'm so thankful that so many puppy raisers can do that because they are definitely changing lives. They definitely are. Well, we're going to take just a quick break and hear some messages from our sponsors, and we'll come right back and continue talking with Ellen. So come right back. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Every pet is unique. Maybe they're gray in the muzzle, yet young at heart. Maybe they're growing out of the puppy stage and into their paws and ears. Or maybe they're just trying to maintain a more girlish figure. At PetSmart, we have the right food for your pet at a great value for you. PetSmart. Be better together. Go to PetLifeRadio.com slash PetSmart and save up to 30% on toys, collars, leashes, PetSmart gift cards, treats, and more. Go to PetLifeRadio.com slash PetSmart today. Dyson. The new Dyson Animal Backs are powerful bagless upright backings for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Back, go to PetLifeRadio.com forward slash Dyson. PetLifeRadio.com forward slash Dyson. To order your Dyson Animal Back today. Dyson. Music to your ears. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to audibledeals.com. That's audibledeals.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Blake here with my sidekick, Super Smiley. <laughs> The giant mutt and spokes dog for throwaways. You're listening to Pet Life Radio, and I'd like to tell you about our brand new show, A Super Smiley Adventure. Our show explores adventures with animals. They can be traveling out in the world trips or inner journeys where our animals lead us to inspiration and self discovery, or just plain fun adventures. Join us here on Pet Life Radio on A Super Smiley Adventure. Good boy. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And we're visiting today with Ellen Tura from Canine Companions for Independence. And before the break, we were talking about puppy raisers and all of the wonderful things that they do. And Ellen, you mentioned that there are five regional offices for CCI. Could you just tell our listeners where those are in case they want to get in touch with someone about becoming a puppy raiser? Absolutely. We have one region in Northern California, Santa Rosa, one region in Southern California, one in Florida, one in Ohio, and uh, the Northeast region here in New York. And those regions serve the entire country. And there is one phone number, a universal 800 number, which is 1-800-572-BARK, B-A-R-K. And depending on where you live, you dial that 1-800 number, it will take you to the region closest to you. And the folks there would be thrilled to take uh, any calls about people interested in puppy raising because we're always looking to bring new people into the family. And it is a family. (laughs) Once people join, once people come in, uh, they have a hard time leaving. We have a a woman that's going to be here later this afternoon who's raised, I think she's on her 23rd puppy. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Also, people can get information from uh, our website as well. There's a lot of information about becoming a puppy raiser, and you can apply online, which is uh, www.cci.org. 
Oh, great. And we will make all this information available on our website for our listeners so that they can have this phone number and the website. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us, Ellen, about the clients that you serve. What ages does CCI serve? Well, there's a big span. The earliest we'll accept an application from someone is the age of five. There is no age limit, but five would be the earliest. And from five to 18, we make a placement which is called a skilled companion placement. And that is an individual, a young individual, receiving a dog for support with the help of usually a parent. If it's an adult that may have some cognitive issues that prohibits them from being able to work a dog independently, it might be their partner that's assisting them. So those folks, the facil- we call them a facilitator. They're really the parent, the spouse, whoever is there assisting is there to make sure that the team is working properly, safely, functioning in the, in the right capacity, and supporting the bonding of that team. People over the age of 18 they will qualify potentially for what we call a service dog. And, you know, the terminology, I'm sure you know, the terminology in the assistance dog field is a little difficult to move through because depending on who you're talking to, we we call things different names. (laughs) But at at CCI, the service dog is the dog that's placed with an adult, someone who's at least 18, who has the ability to manage and care for the dog for the most part, independently. They don't need the assistance of a, of a partner or an aide or a spouse or a parent to help them manage the dog. And so that's the first thing that we look at. What we look at when people apply for a dog is, well, number one, what are they looking for from the dog? Sometimes people come to us with unrealistic expectations. They want the dog to stop their child from running out of the house and into the street. Well, we don't place dogs that do that. Or sometimes people may come to us with expectations that we can't meet simply because we don't train the dog to do certain things. There are some organizations that train dogs to alert to seizures, for example. So if we received an application for that, we would refer them out to another organization. But if they're looking for the tasks that our dogs perform, retrieving things, picking things up that people have dropped, getting things from high places, opening and closing doors, pulling wheelchairs, turning lights on and off. Those are the sorts of tasks that we train for. And if that's what they're looking for, then we'll enter into a discussion. It's actually a long application process about their lifestyle and their experience. And we're talking about accumulating medical forms and then references, biographies, It's a five-step process, basically, and it culminates in a personal interview. So the individual will come down to our center, and uh, we do this actually in a group. So it's it's sort of an interesting day. You get to meet a number of people, maybe, you know, five, six people that are all interested in potentially getting a dog. And what we do is we run almost like a miniature class first. Uh, We set people up and um, bring some dogs out and give them some basic dog handling tips and work with them for a little bit. And what we're looking for is teachability. You know, we're not looking for, are you an excellent dog handler? Have you had a ton of experience? But we're looking for somebody that says, I want this. I want to enhance my life this way. I'll follow direction. And I'm committed to this. At the end of the handling portion, there's a personal interview. And after that personal interview, which goes into tremendous detail about the person's lifestyle, then we have a committee that sits down and says, can we effectively serve this person? Can we give them what they're looking for? Do we have the right kind of dogs? Can they work within our structure? So, for example, CCI, all of our students have to come to a two-week class at our facilities. So they have to be able to leave their home, leave their job, leave their work, leave their kids, whatever it may be, for two weeks. So two weeks for a lifetime of a dog is not a huge investment. It's a very short period of time, but it's not always practical for everyone, as you had mentioned. You know, it's not always something that everyone can do. But at CCI, that's the requirement. They come, they stay on our campus in our dormitory for two weeks with an entire class and are matched up with the dog, learn how to handle it, care for it. And as a matter of fact, today, uh, we'll be taking our new group of students out to the local mall to run them through the Assistance Dogs International Access Test and make sure that they are going to be good, strong representatives for the assistance dog industry, handle the dogs properly, present themselves properly. I'm pretty excited. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be such an exciting day for them. How fun. 
Well, it's just such an incredible process, and I, I love the way that, that it really is. As you said, it's a five-step process, and that's so wonderful because, as you mentioned earlier, it is such a commitment that I'm sure you have to feel confident before you can let someone take one of these amazing animals home that they really are committed to the process and understand what they're signing up for and really well, can handle yeah. a dog. That's an excellent point, I mean, and that's one of the reasons there is an application process, A, and B, that it's so long, because we want to make sure somebody going through all the trouble of getting medical forms and references and doing a phone interview and coming all the way to our center, that's a demonstration of commitment and drive, mm-hmm. yeah. and we need to see that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you made it, it's a very good point. Well, I was yep. curious, too, about, because you serve such a diverse group of ages, do you separate the 5 to 18 into a class, or do you have the 18 and older and the younger students all in a class together? Well, the answer is kind of both. When we have a group of dogs that's ready to be placed, let's say we have 15 dogs, they're fully trained, they're ready to be placed, and we know how they're going to best serve someone. We know this dog is going to be a great hearing dog for someone with uh, hearing loss. This dog is going to be a great dog to work for a child. This will be a great dog to work for an adult. This dog will be a great dog to work in a rehab facility with a number of different people that are going through, say, physical rehab. So we know who those dogs are. They're not all the same. So if we have 15 dogs ready, they're not all going to be skilled companion dogs. They're all going to be facility dogs. They're all going to be service dogs. They're going to be different. We call people in that match up the dogs we have. So typically our classes are mixed. And our class right now that we're running has uh, two facilities in it. I think we've got uh, one, two, three service and five uh, skilled companion teams. So it's a mixture. What we do is we keep them together for the lectures because the material is the same. Who a dog is, how to manage a dog, how to care for it, how to motivate it, all of that is the same. But then when it comes down to practice sessions, we break them up. We go to different training rooms and we focus on different things, different tasks, different ways of managing the dog. So we can really then cater to the difference in the placement categories. Yeah, that's awesome. And it makes sense, too. The other nice thing about that is I know when I went through the program, it was so wonderful to bond with the other students and to share things that we were experiencing together. That was really helpful in learning those skills and and really building that confidence. So I love that approach that you have them together and yet then you can segregate them and work more on things that are more appropriate to what that dog's job will be. That's really cool. Right. Yeah. And we're really in a fortunate position now because years ago when, when you went through class, our, we had a tiny little center. We did not have a dormitory. And now at the end of the day, everybody goes back to the dormitory and they really, they're, they've really become very, very close. Yeah. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of two weeks, we've got lifelong friendships that have been formed, the people that have supported. You can't say enough for somebody that's not ever gone through a team training, the amount of stress and how hard work it is. Yeah. And so to have people that are going through it with you right there to support you through it is just so important. It is. It is. And it is such an incredible experience that really is life changing. By the end of those two weeks, you're not the same person you were when you showed up two weeks earlier. No, certainly it, not. <laughs> and I, and, but in a good way. And I know that's hard for people to understand, but it really is true that that you do go through so much, not only physically, but emotionally of dealing with your own personal issues and how you're going to interact with this dog and and how you need to take a leadership role and really be responsible. So it's just such a growing experience that's so incredible. It's one of the things that's so unique about working with the dog is that it makes you more aware of yourself. Um, yes. And sometimes it's simple <laughs> things like we talk about body language, sit up straight, stand up straight, move confidently, all of those things. But also how you feel inside is reflected to Mm -hmm. the dog and the dog is like a mirror to who we are and so part of going through training with one of these dogs is really having to look at yourself and sometimes being a little uncomfortable about certain (laughs) things Um, or or sometimes being able to say hey this piece of me works really great right here (laughs) you know Um, an enthusiastic personality somebody who's very enthusiastic and expressive well, that can work really wonderfully to motivate and reward a dog. Somebody who's, a, who's <laughs> quiet, maybe a little inhibited, might be struggling more with that aspect of their personality because they need to come out of themselves to connect with this animal. Yeah. So it's, it's really a learning experience. 
It is, and it is a connection. I mean, it really is. It's a lifelong connection. So tell me a little bit more about the application process. Is there a fee that someone has to pay, Ellen, for one of your dogs? There is no fee. Canine Companions for Independence is a nonprofit. We do not charge to receive a dog. This is one of the reasons why it's so critically important that we have puppy raisers that are willing to raise these dogs for us because what it costs to actually train them and follow up with them for the lifetime of their placement is probably just about $40,000 per dog from the moment that they're bred to the end of their working life because we do follow up with all of our teams. So that's a very long period of time that you're looking at. Yeah, Yeah, that is. And I I know, I just think it's so amazing that CCI can do that and provide the dogs free of charge to people. Well, what we do really is we rely, number one, we rely on puppy raisers to raise the pups for us. Because again, without them, we couldn't do what we do. So if any puppy raisers are out there listening, thank you (laughs) (laughs) for helping us. Thank you, thank you, yes. (laughs) But the other thing is that, you know, we look for support from foundations, from grants, individual donors. There's a lot of different ways to support CCI, getting involved. We have local chapters across the country that do events for us to raise money, and that's how we survive. And that's how we're able to provide these dogs to people free of charge. And what, Ellen, is the waiting list time now from the five-step process until someone gets to meet their dog and be at your training facility? About how long is that now? That depends dramatically. I think years ago, we had a waiting list of six, seven, even eight years. It was just unfathomable. Now, it could be anywhere from probably six months to two years that you'd wait. So what that's going to depend on is primarily two things. One is how intricate a person's needs are. And two, how flexible they are in terms of when they can come to class. We have classes four times a year. They're scheduled way in advance. I could tell you our schedule through 2013. (laughs) So I might say, you might be on the very top of our waiting list, and I might know that I can make a great placement with you. But if I call you up and you say, listen, I can't get away for those two weeks, well, you're going to have to wait longer. And, you know, maybe we'll have a dog for you in the next class. Maybe we won't. So the next time we have a dog for you, we'll call you up again. We'll say, hey. Are you available? We can do this. Can you come in? We give people, you know, about two months notice so they can try to make arrangements in their life to uh, be able to attend. But it's not always easy to do that. So sometimes people will wait longer simply because they don't have that kind of flexibility in their life. And like I said, we won't call somebody in unless we know we've got the right dog for them. So we work based on the waiting list. We look at the first person on the waiting list and say, hey, do we have a dog for you? And then we go to the second person and we go to the third person. It's based on your position on the waiting list. But if you're not able to come in, we'll just keep moving down that list. So, you know, if you are, it could be as fast as six months. And if your needs are more intricate and your schedule is less flexible, I'd say probably two years would be about the longest wait. Yeah, well, that's great. That is so much quicker than it was when I first applied 20 years ago, which I'm so happy to hear that for people because I'll never forget the day you called me and invited me to come to a class. I felt like I had just won the lottery. I was screaming (laughs) in my office. I was so excited when I hung the phone up. I was screaming that all my coworkers came running to my office to make sure I was okay. And I was telling them. (laughs) Yeah, those are fun calls for us to make because usually people are so so excited. Yes, I was yeah. beside myself. Yes, it was quite an incredible call and it, it definitely was the call that changed my life. So I just can't thank you enough for being with us today, Ellen, and I could sit and talk to you all day, but I know you've got to get your students and get them ready for graduation tomorrow, which is just so exciting for them. And and I don't know if, if our listeners, if you have a chance to go to a CCI graduation, it's an incredible experience. The graduation in itself is so beautiful. So I, I hope that one of these days all of our listeners can get to a graduation Yeah, it's a a wonderful way to actually see elements of the whole program. The graduation dates are listed on our website, www.cci.org. So at any of the regions closest to you, they're open to the public. And the same day that we graduate our new teams is the same day that new puppies are turned in to start training. So you see the whole cycle and you're able to meet the graduates and meet the puppy raisers and get a much better idea of what it really feels like to be part of the organization. Yeah, well, it is an incredible process and just, I mean, a fabulous organization. And thank you, Ellen, for all the work that you've done and all the work you continue to do. And I hope 
hope you'll come back and visit with us again. Thank you, Marcy. I would love to. It's been great talking to you. Well, and thank you, our listeners, for being with us today. We'd love for you to stop by. And we also love to hear from you. So please keep those emails coming. I love to get your questions and comments. And you can email us at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. And you can also follow us at Working Like Dogs on Facebook and Twitter. So we'd love to hear from you, and we hope you'll come back and join us real soon. So take good care. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.